Grande Foundation. Please take your seats. We've got a pretty full room tonight, so we're about to get started here. Have a uh, I think we have one more member of the Rio Grande Foundation here, Vic Bruno. I'd like to thank all Rio Grande Foundation donors for their support for events like this one and for all the other things that we do. Uh, most recently, you may have seen Jim Scarantino. He's been Absolutely on a roll recently. He uh, got a tour of Manny Aragon's castle down in the South Valley. Check it out on YouTube if you haven't already done so. I'd also like to thank Rio Grande Foundation employees. I see Corey Davis coming in. He's going to be doing our timing tonight, so give everybody a... Jean, Jean, our vice president, has uh, the flu bug that's going around, so she is not here tonight. Paige McKenzie helped many of you out front, so uh, I don't know if she's in here, but Paige. And uh, Luke DeGreiter is doing some filming here in the front. And uh, my wife Krista, who is almost ready to give birth here in January, she helped out with all this, so she's out front as well. So. Everyone's still actively getting people checked in and uh, getting things started here. So, why is the Rio Grande Foundation hosting a candidate forum when the election is nearly a year away? Well, to put it simply, we are proponents of ideas. And we figure that it's never too early for an exchange of ideas. And we believe that the candidates will have an honest and open exchange of ideas here tonight. And I think it'll be a very interesting and informative experience. But also there's another arguably more greedy reason, which is that party politics so often dominate uh, who winds up running for office, and those are not necessarily idea people. They're party functionaries do their work, but uh, unfortunately they don't always <coughs> pick principal candidates. I think any Republican who saw what happened in the last presidential election might have uh, been frustrated by that kind of thing. And the Republican Party in New Mexico, for example, has not always had a very stellar track record of picking the best candidate that can win the race. That is if they can find a candidate to run in the race. <laughs> so we're blessed this year with four <clears throat> candidates running, and we're going to have uh, two candidates here answering your questions, and Whitney Cheshire representing the Alan Way campaign will be doing a five-minute introduction of that campaign. So the format is going to be as follows. We'll have each candidate or Whitney do five minutes to introduce the candidate themselves, their vision for New Mexico. Then after that five-minute introduction, uh, we'll have many of you should have put questions on slips of paper. I've asked the candidates we're going to it's football season, we're going to call a bit of an audible. We're going to go with some of those questions for starters. And at my discretion, as the evening wears on, we may open it up to the floor for more spontaneous questions from the crowd. So with that, let's get started. And I would like to bring up Whitney Cheshire here to make a statement from the Alan Wake campaign. Thank you. talk off the cuff, but since I'm representing Alan, I figure I ought to use a, a few notes um, since I am representing him as the candidate. Uh, I want to thank the Rio Grande Foundation, Foundation for putting all this together and letting me make a couple of comments on behalf of Alan. Um, I'm sorry that he couldn't be with you tonight. He's actually back on the East Coast and will be until um, the end of the weekend. So many of you may know Alan from his time as the chairman from the Republican Party. And um, during the four years that he served there, he set records for fundraising and for voter registration. He also unfortunately served um, during two of the toughest cycles for Republicans um, since Watergate, so that uh, as well as part of his uh, tenured time. Um, but he always was a steady voice for common sense policies and priorities, and he always stood up for what was right. Um, Allen has never held political office before, 
And I can tell you honestly that this is one of the things that is resonating most strongly on the campaign trail. In fact, when we've been out collecting petition signatures to get him on the ballot, many, many people have refused to sign that petition until they found out that he wasn't a career politician. Um, instead, Allen spent uh, more than 30 years dedicating his life to serving his country in the United States Marine Corps, um, as well as running a successful business in the state of New Mexico. In case you don't know about Allen's past, uh, he actually ended up leaving home at the age of 17, and by his own words, he was not the most stellar of students. So he enlisted into the Marine Corps and spent two years there instead of going directly to college. When he finished up, he applied for colleges, and he was very proud that the University of New Mexico accepted him. And as testimony to his get-it-done attitude, this was his first real challenge. Um, he ended up finishing a four-year degree in less than three years. At about that time, the Vietnam War was starting, and um, he ended up um, rejoining the Marines and going to Vietnam. About three months into his first tour, he was badly injured. They had to lift him out on a helicopter, and he spent about seven months recovering at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Um, and for all of his trouble, instead of accepting a desk duty after that, he wanted to be sent back with his men to Vietnam, and he served a, t a second tour of duty in Vietnam, where he earned two more Purple Hearts. Alan came back to New Mexico when he was done with that and uh, worked and finished a master's degree here shortly after started his own business. In 1979, CSI Aviation was founded. It's an air charter services company, and Alan began it with nothing more than a big work ethic and a small loan from the bank and some really great ideas. Now it employs about 25 people. He's been in business for over 30 years, and it's a successful New Mexico company. Allen's military service did not stop in Vietnam. He also served in the first uh, Gulf War. He served in Somalia, and he served as chief of staff for the Marine Forces Pacific, where he oversaw about 85,000 Marines and naval officers. His last tour of duty took him to Iraq in 2003, uh, when he went over after the war was complete to help train the Iraqi army. In short, Allen's life has been a testimony to hard work, dedication, service, and results. It's this experience and set of values that he will take to Santa Fe as governor. When people ask where Alan stands on the issues in a short meeting like this, I would just have to tell you right up front, he's pro-business, he's pro-private property rights, pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, and anti-tax. On the campaign trail, he has said he won't raise taxes and get rid of, he will focus on getting rid of irrational regulations that are holding our small businesses back. For example, two days ago we sent out a statement that within 48 hours of his election, he will get rid of the amendment to the pit rule, which is uh, right now driving oil and gas business out of the state of New Mexico. He has already pledged to do that. He has said that he intends to run the state like he has run his business, being successful in certain areas. He says the four main components have made him successful. Number one, he only hires good, qualified employees that can get the job done. Number two, uh, he'll insist on top-notch customer service, and in this case, the customer is the voter and the people of New Mexico. He'll balance a budget, and he'll remain accountable to the customer. And again, in government, that means to you and me. Um, I believe I've also heard him say, oh, I believe, sorry, when it comes to corruption in government, he talks about this quite a bit, uh, makes me a little nervous. He talks about taking a baseball bat to Santa Fe. Um, and I have heard him use the word cattle prod. Um, of course, I've recommended um, that maybe he leave this kind of vocabulary out of his um, speaking engagements, but as most of you know, Alan usually calls things like he sees them, and we can all expect him to do that as governor. Uh, as a final note, since I'm the campaign manager, people like to ask me how the campaign's going, and I'd like to tell you it's going absolutely fantastic. It's been a long time since I had this much fun on a campaign. Um, Alan is also a prostate cancer survivor. In 2004, he was diagnosed and has been uh, cancer-free ever since. And part of the thing that we've been doing on the campaign trail is raising <coughs> awareness for healthy lifestyles. Um, and we've been running and walking in races around New Mexico. We did the 5K, Alan did the 5K in the Duke City Marathon, 10K in Roswell this past weekend. Had a, had a great time and we're having a good time on the campaign trail. If anybody would like to find out any more about Alan, his website is www.allenway2010.com. And there's information out in the hallway. And um, if any of you ever have any kind of follow-up questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now the two candidates will come down and take their seats.
And I would reiterate one thing that Whitney said, which is that there is information not only from the Way campaign, but from other, from both of the other candidates as well, out on tables out there. A lot of it was set up before, after people had already entered the room. So uh, there's still people collecting signatures and all kinds of goodies. Uh, and if you need to change your voting registration since the last election, that can be done as well. So we're going to do uh, ladies first, and Representative Arnold Jones uh, introduce her, and then she'll give her five minutes, and Doug will get his afterwards. So Janice Arnold Jones is in her fourth term in the New Mexico House of Representatives for District 24. In her capacity as state representative, she serves on the House Taxation and Revenue Committee and the Voters and Elections Committee. Her interim committee assignments include the Mexico Finance Authority Oversight, the Mexico Mortgage Finance Authority Oversight, and Science, Technology, and Telecommunications. Also, Revenue Stabilization and Tax Policy, Information Technology Oversight, New Mexico Mortgage Finance Authority, Legislative Structure and Process Study Task Force and Legislative Council. That's a mouthful uh, for me to say. This in addition, she serves on the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission. I didn't know there was such a thing. Election Reform Task Force, Revenue Stabilization and Tax Policy Committee, Information Technology and Oversight Committee, and several others. Several others. Well, um, Janice's community involvement includes the New Mexico Poison and Drug Information Center, which she chairs, New Mexico Commission for Public Broadcasting, Bernalillo County of Health Council of Health Councils. <coughs> She is also well recognized for her tireless efforts on behalf of American Youth Soccer Organization, Region 104, where she served as chief coach. She also developed a training and tracking regimen for over 500 assistant coaches and 350 referees annually. Janice holds a Bachelor of Arts in Speech Communication from the University of New Mexico. Her interest in politics began when she ran for and was elected to serve as vice president of the Associated Students of New the University of New Mexico. She also became a legislative intern for Republican members of the state senate and was instrumental in writing the passage and passage of New Mexico's criminal sexual conduct legislation. Janice is currently employed by Parallax Incorporated, managing the local office, office utilizing her 30 years of diverse managerial, administrative, and communications experience in that role. Her past employment has included project management, business management, consulting, research analyst, technical writer, variety of other tasks for the Department of Energy. She has a depth of, depth of experience and remains keenly interested in information technology, the importance of database development, network connectivity, and the use of data and guided management <coughs> solutions. Janice was honored recently as a recipient of the 2009 Lights of Liberty Award by the Rio Grande Foundation for using a webcam in support of public open access to New Mexico. <coughs> She's married to John L. Jones, commander, retired U.S. Navy, has two children, and resides in Albuquerque. I want to begin by applauding the Rio Grande Foundation for creating an opportunity for candidates to present ourselves to the public and the media in what I believe is a historic moment. <coughs> Most often, the voting public is not exposed to the broader field of candidates until just before the primary election. This event will allow you to become better acquainted with those of us present this <coughs> evening to, to allow you a choice in whose campaign you might want to support over the next weeks and months. We are also at a historic moment in our nation and in our state. For it has never been that we are in such a state of despair and depression in so many of our trusted institutions. Here in New Mexico, where we are so often at the top of the failures, <coughs> the ethical lapses, crime and corruption, pay to play, and closed door, closed door backroom politics that continue unfettered. Over the last seven years, New Mexico government has become bloated, budgets have been broken, the Constitution is being trampled, education has failed, overregulation is the norm, cronyism is high, all economic classes are worse off, businesses are failing, the economy stinks. 
and private capital won't come here without huge infusions of corporate welfare, which only adds to the burden of taxpayers. There is, however, a glimmer of hope, and you're it. As our republic has done since its early days, the people are rising up. We can find opportunity when everyday citizens are paying attention, and you are. And they are now demanding something more than a soundbite to cure these problems. I have been meeting with concerned citizens around the state, Tea Party groups, 912 coalitions, Republican Party meetings, and my own Saturday morning coffees, and their voices are all saying the same thing. Stop the insanity. Stop it now. Restore government to its basics, end the ethical lapses, crime, corruption, cronyism, pay to play, and theft from taxpayers. Foster an environment of trust and embolden a framework of private enterprise to take hold and grow jobs for the benefit of our citizens. I am running for governor to do just that because I am the right woman with the right background at the right time. As governor, I will focus on diversifying our state's economy. New Mexico is languishing in the state of potential. It is caused by regulatory tax and tax uncertainty and a clear message that government makes it difficult to do business in New Mexico. It is time to move from a state of potential to a state of excellence and a state of prosperity. You begin that change with a commitment to private enterprise and entrepreneurial zeal. As governor, I will bring ethical leadership to address our history of corruption, and I will treat my service to you as a public trust. As governor, I will not tolerate the shakedown of business as a right to do business. Ethics must be matched with education. Almost 62% of our budget goes to education, with barely 50% of our students graduating and only 46% graduating from UNM in six years. I would say that education has clearly been an investment with the poorest return. No more. If our educational institutions cannot deliver results, we must look elsewhere. New Mexico has tremendous opportunity. It is rich in intellectual capital and natural resources. As your governor, I will lead New Mexico to become the largest exporter of energy in the nation. To do so will require a commitment to the necessary infrastructure for energy transmission, internet and telephone connectivity, a renewed commitment to resource application, including the latest advances in mining and agriculture. We can diversify our economy and enable every New Mexican to take control of their lives without waiting for the government. As your governor, your government will be open and transparently accountable to you. Now, as you know, there are some revenue enhancement hearings going on. You like that term. I want you to know that I called uh, uh, Secretary Homans earlier this week and requested that he webcast the remainder of those activities. And I hope you saw that yesterday he put that in place. As governor, I will bring to New Mexico a new and smarter economy while respecting our traditions. We will connect New Mexico's vast natural resources and transform our state into one that excels, not one that fails. New Mexicans are ready to embrace the future, but now we need leadership that provides practical solutions instead of rhetoric. Please connect with us. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Anderson. Thank you. <coughs> Next is Doug Turner. Doug was born and raised in New Mexico. He met his wife in eighth grade. That's Amazing. <laughs> Does that mean you haven't changed since eighth grade? No, it took us 25 years to actually get married. Okay. <laughs> he met her in eighth grade at Jefferson Middle School in Albuquerque. This is where he built his business, and it's where he and his wife are raising their two children. Doug is not a career politician, yet as a businessman and community leader, 
He has faced every issue that is important to New Mexicans. He confronted corruption in government as chairman of the New Mexico uh, Judicial Standards Commission under Governor Gary Johnson, fought for jobs and new businesses as chairman of the Albuquerque Economic Development Commission, and has been a vocal advocate for oil and gas and indus energy industries that provide nearly 50% of our state budget. For nearly 20 years, he has provided political and strategic counsel to Fortune 500 companies, elected officials, government, and nonprofit organizations. Doug started his own company more than 12 years ago in his apartment, and it has since grown into one of the largest public relations firms in the Southwest, employing more than 24 people. His firm, D.W. Turner, has helped our state's economy <coughs> grow and created high-quality, high-paying jobs for New Mexicans. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in international relations. In 1993, Doug worked for Senator Pete Domenici and the Senate Budget Committee in Washington, D.C. And in 1998, he managed Governor Johnson's come-from-behind re-election win. He is a board member of the New Mexico Coalition for Charter Schools, a life member of the NRA, a member of the American Council of Young Political Leaders, and served on the Republican Governors Association National Finance Committee. I'm not really used to uh, standing behind a podium. I'm more of a roamer, so uh, if, I, if I move from side to side, don't worry. Um, I think you're all here either because your campaign asked you to be here, uh, or actually because you are, like most of us, and genuinely care about the future of New Mexico. I think you're all aware of what the issues are that we're facing. Janice did a great job uh, of outlining many of those issues. So I thought I might take a few minutes to give you a little bit more uh, personal information about myself and, and why I'm running. Uh, as I was walking in here, I was talking to uh, uh, John Jones. Uh, I grew up about uh, a quarter of a mile from here spent most of my childhood playing in this park. Before it was a park, it was a dirt field. And this building, uh, for those of you who remember, certainly my parents who are sitting here remember, uh, it was Navajo Trucking Company. Navajo Trucking Company went out of business, and my brother and I used to come here during the summers and in the winters when my father would say, go outside, don't watch TV, do something interesting. And we would walk throughout this entire building, and it was vacant, and come home with miles and miles of colored wire when, as we would rip out the electrical of this building. Uh, so, you know, it's amazing to see, you know, how, how things can, can change over, over 30 years. Uh, you know, why am I involved in this and why am I interested in what government can do for, for, uh, for people in the state? Uh, you know, again, I talk about my childhood. When I was seven or eight years old, um, my parents uh, decided that it would be a good idea that perhaps I should sell lemonade and do something useful in the summertime. And so my father went to Hutchinson Fruit Company and built me a small lemonade stand and we made a, pit, a, 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 a big thermos of lemonade and went down to Old Town right here. And I was mortified. And uh, you know, I was scared to death what was going to happen. And my father said, well, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? The worst thing that could happen was no one would buy the lemonade. And you know what? They bought the lemonade. And my brothers and I had a lemonade stand in Old Town for probably 17 years, which is really quite amazing. I had my first check, checking account when I was eight. Um, but, but what happened over time is the snow cone guy and the Coke guy kind of got annoyed that the Turner brothers were, were monopolizing the drink and refreshment business in the summertime, and so they complained to the Old Town police. And so my father said, well, you should go down to City Hall and speak to somebody about it. And so I marched down, and I got on my, my bike, and I went down to City Hall. And I met with a guy named Steve Schiff, who at the time was a DA for Albuquerque. And uh, I explained the situation to Steve, and he said, hold on a minute. And he took a business card out of his desk, and he wrote a little note on the back, and he says, anyone who has a problem with the Turner Brothers selling lemonade in Old Town, you call me. And so, for years, we would hold that card up anytime someone would come to the <laughs> But the point here is, is, is that is an example of what government should be doing. It should be looking for ways to get government out of the way and to allow people to grow their businesses and to you know, engage in commerce. And, and you know, as, as I've gotten older, I've really appreciated what Steve Schiff did for me when I was about 10 or 12 years old. 
Uh, and I think we've gotten away from that. You know, I'm a small businessman here in Albuquerque, and I've struggled uh, for the last 12 years to grow a business in a state like this. It's very, very difficult. And those of you who are in business yourselves can attest to how challenging it is, where you have government as the primary employer in the state. And I think uh, the Rio Grande Foundation has released some numbers that New Mexico is twice the na national average when it comes to employment. Now, we recently did some polling. And when you ask people, you know, are we, uh, are we moving in the right direction, are we moving in the wrong direction? And interestingly, in most parts of the country, most people believe we're moving in the wrong direction. But in New Mexico, 50% of the people believe we're moving in the right direction. Because 50% of the people work for government. <laughs> and something's fundamentally wrong with a state and economy that's driven by tax dollars, whether it be state, local, or federal and not by small businesses. Small businesses in this country employ 85% of all the people. We are the economic drivers, and we need a state government that is prepared to work with business and not uh, try and keep business out of the way. And a state government that's not in business to keep itself in business, but really that's in business to go out of business. So I'm running for governor because I think we can do that. I think the opportunity for amazing change is now. There's enormous dissatisfaction in this country and in this state with what's being rammed down our throat. And, uh, you know, I'm an advocate of small government, and as governor, that's probably the most important thing that I would push for, is a smaller, less intrusive government. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and I hope you ask some great questions today. All right, now we'll go with the question period here. Each candidate will have three minutes to answer the question. Keep your eye on that. Uh, Lighting tree there. Oh. It'll go uh, yellow at two minutes, and then three minutes is uh, the red light. Corey has shown it there, and then hopefully you can. Uh, I know politicians can talk for quite a long time, but hopefully. I want to know will we get penalized if we're No. Charge. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, I'll, How big of a role should the energy energy in energy industry play in Mexico's economy, and what should government do to encourage or discourage it? Janice first. Wow, I love that question. You know, this state is unlike any other state, and energy should be our largest export. Now, energy comes in many different forms. That is coal, oil and gas, you all are well, well aware of that but we also have the opportunity to bring in wind, solar, geothermal, as well as nuclear. There is no state better poised to be an exporter of energy than this state. We do have a problem, however. You have to have the transmission to get the power to market, and it, can, it has to be able to go to any energy grid. In my opinion, energy is what is going to diversify our economy. And we are going to have to make some choices to get there. And so you do have a choice. Do you want to diversify your economy? Here's a ready-made avenue to get there, and it is energy. So the simple answer is energy should pay, play a huge role in our state. What she said. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and energy and actually the extractive industries in New Mexico have really been a cornerstone of our economy, you know, forever. Um, you know, they, we are, I think, number three and number five in, in uh, crude and natural gas production. I'm not sure which is which, is which but in the country. I mean, there are states that would die to be to have the resources that New Mexico has. Um, um, I, I'm actually a, a big advocate for nuclear power. And we have, you know, uh, and I, we, have, we, have, we have enormous uranium resources and modern mining techniques uh, in the western, used in, if used properly in the western part of the state, would be a huge economic driver. I mean, there's been an economic impact study that was done by the Goldwater Institute uh, for the uranium in industry, and it estimated in the billions in terms of what it would bring in tax revenue. 
Uh, unfortunately, we have an administration that's been blocking growth in, in uranium mining and resurgence in, in uranium mining. We have uh, one of the first uh, nuclear projects in 20 years built, be, being built in, in the lower part of New Mexico, the National Enrichment Facility, which is a uranium enrichment facility. You know, when you think that China is talking about a demand for 10,000 tons of enriched uranium in the next 10 years and only has the capacity to produce 800, uh, there's a market for what we can produce here. Uh, one thing which we're probably not paying attention to, although we know it, is it, it, the fact that our budget is getting killed in this state because of a huge decline in oil and gas revenue largely. And yet we have an administration which is, which is creating a regulatory environment uh, to make it very difficult for a lot of those oil and gas companies to profitably drill for more oil and gas. And in fact, Texas has been going up in terms of their production. I think they've gone up about 14% in the last year, while New Mexico has seen a 50% <coughs> decline in the number of rigs that are actually in the field. So from the perspective of what a governor can do, uh, you heard Whitney talk about the pit rule. Uh, the pit rule uh, is something that can be revisited. Uh, a governor can, cre can create incentives for companies to go out and drill more wells, and certainly be an advocate for nuclear power in the state. This state ought to be have a, have a role in every piece of the nuclear life cycle. We have a history of it, and we have the space for it, and the technology, and why not take advantage of it? As an aside, if you, both of you haven't read it, and the audience hasn't read it, there's an excellent article in today's Albuquerque Journal by a Democratic State Senator Yuli Berry uh, on the uranium issue. So, nice to see not all Democrats are uh, opposed to economic development as the government. Okay. okay, next question for Doug. Are you for limited government? If you are, how would you start to dismantle the many government agencies? The many government agencies in New Mexico? That's the, what the question. Well, I presumably so. <laughs> uh, I didn't write the questions. Yes, I, I am for limited government. You know, what's remarkable is that we have 19,000 state employees. That's not local, that's just state, which I think is four to 5,000 more than we had seven years ago. In fact, knowing that we were headed into a budget crisis, in the last two years, the administration added another 700 people. So we obviously have an administration that doesn't believe in smaller government. Uh, and the problem with all those people is that you can't get rid of them so easily. Once, unless they are, they're serving at the pleasure of the governor, uh, they're really there until uh, they de either do something so egregious that we, you can get rid of them or until they retire. So, um, you know, in addition to that, we have, I think, 700 plus political appointees, and the previous administration had just over 200. Uh, so, you want to look about where we can save money and recurring expenses, it's certainly in the size of state government. Another thing that's happened over the last few years is we have uh, uh, amazing uh, dupli duplication of state services being provided by different agencies. You look at the Department of Health, we have the Department of Human Services, and then there are a whole ton of other commissions and organizations that are designed to provide health care for New Mexicans, all of which do the same thing, or more or less the same thing. An example of this is the separation between behavioral health care in New Mexico and regular health care. Uh, under the previous administration, they were all merged into one set of administrative duties. <coughs> this administration has divided them, and so we have two sets of people doing billing, two sets of people doing, uh, 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 you know, customer service, and it's a, it's an incredible waste, an incredible drain on state government resources, and certainly in today's uh, economic climate, a terrible drain on our tax uh, on our taxes. Uh, especially when we are hearing that there's going to be 32 or 34 potential new taxes, many of them are probably terribly regressive, uh, that are going to be proposed in this next legislative session. So as governor, I mean, you, you've got to make government smaller. If anyone goes up to Santa Fe and tries to do any business up there, recently you'll notice that there's no place to park for people who are actually wanting government service because they're all state employees who work up there. <laughs> now, that's not to say that state employees are bad, but we certainly have too many of them. I would 
hope, I, and, I, and I must say, ditto. I, I just have to say that. Um, you know, our government, uh, since I have served, uh, and I came in with this governor, and in that period of time, our government has grown by 45%. And so I have to ask you, have the services improved 45%? No. That's the problem right there. And so the question then becomes, as governor, how do you whittle it down? Where do you start? And actually, the answers are, are relatively simple. As governor, the first thing you have to recognize that a budget is the ceiling, that is the maximum. It's not a suggestion, it's the maximum. And if you think you're getting to that point, then you cut back. That's the first thing. And having watched this, and I will remind you that for 2009, we are overspent by $325 million. <coughs> our books are not closed. Any of you who have a business like that and you're 90 days out and you haven't closed your books, you're in trouble. <coughs> so, where do we start? I, the easy ones to pick off are the exempt employees. We have gone from, I, I believe, a reasonable, rational number of about 170, and the last count was almost 800. And you need to look at, you know, because they come in different categories, so hard to tell where they are. Um, they won't tell you. That's exactly right. They won't tell you. Um, the next place that I would look right off the bat is paid administrative leave. We have 86 employees that I'm aware of on paid administrative leave. One has been on paid administrative leave for over five years. One of the newer ones has went on leave June 24th of this year, still on paid administrative leave. I hope you're saying, where are the managers? Because I am. Where's the system? Nobody, no employee should be treated like that, and no taxpayer should be treated like that. Then you should ask the question of, is the individual competent? I think competence is a really important question because we have people, and especially in the industry that I'm in, who are, uh, they don't know what they're doing, so why are they there? Uh, are they uh, providing services that are mission related? Uh, the next thing that you need to look at when you are carving out the budget is, okay, can we hit the boards and commissions? I believe that any board and commission that is an observe and report board or commission is fair game. Boards or commissions that are providing direct services you might want to look at. Making broad sweeping cuts may do more damage than you think. It's important that we take the time to do the carve outs to make a smart, efficient, smaller government. question is a yes or no, but I'm going to supplement it uh, because I'm a moderator and I can do that. <laughs> With the science in question, do you, do you believe global warming is real? And I would specifically point you to two policy areas in New Mexico, the Western Climate Initiative, of which New Mexico is a part, and the Environmental Improvement Board, an unelected body that's now uh, having hearings and taking comments on placing Uh, I'm placing more drastic cuts than even the cap and trade bill moving through Washington would have uh, in not an elected body. So, with that, I think it's Janice's turn. I would say so. Rephrase the way you want that yes or no? No, no, no. They asked it the yes or no. I'm elaborating a little bit on those two the Western Climate Initiative and the Environmental Improvement Board and what you think about them. Okay. There was a period in our country's history where we had something called acid rain. There was good science. We found some, some very directed strategies to change what we were doing, and it changed the way that we did things, and it changed the results. And we have done away with acid rain, and I'm glad of that. There are other things that we are doing that defy any kind of logic. Now, I must confess that I, I actually live and, and, and hang out with a water guy. And he kept telling me about uh, the fact that we're, we're, we're in uh, global warming and there's no water. And I said, how come you keep pumping? And he says, because I have more water. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that led to the next question of, is this related to something that we're doing? Is it related to sunspots? Yes. And you know what? There is a tremendous correlation. So as we go forward, you know, I think that we are all supposed to be stewards of our land. We're supposed to do that, but it needs to be rational, and it needs to be founded in some degree of certainty. Can we certainly discern 
and find a remediation for acid rain? We absolutely can. Do I believe that plants need you to breathe because you produce CO2? Yes, I do. And so there is a balance. You know, there is a balance. And, and I guess I would sum up that there is a lot of hysteria going on, but, but I actually believe in our Creator. And I believe that we have a great deal of hubris to think that we ourselves are going to stop nature today, this year, with any way that we spend our money. I'm glad we're doing this forum because it's, it's allowing me to create a list of things that I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I have an opinion on most everything, but there are certain things I don't know. And I don't honestly know a lot about the environmental so I'm going to have to I'll do some talk. Okay. <laughs> Give me a download. Um, uh, I actually do think that, that, uh, that man can have a detrimental impact on the environment. Uh, but I also think that, much like uh, Janice said, that we also have to couch our responses uh, with um, good science. And lately, a lot of you have probably heard there's a, some controversy going on about some emails that were uh, uh, a computer that was hacked at the University of East Anglia, I believe, about a, a group of scientists who were telling their colleagues to delete their, their, their messages and let's make sure we all coordinate on what we're going to say. Um, I think there's a huge industry that has grown and, and, and is booming uh, around fear that we are destroying our environment. And, 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 and I think that that's not good. But I also think that we do need to be good stewards of our environment. Um, you know, I'd like to know, for example, that the recycling that I put out on my curb tomorrow morning is actually going to be recycled, but it's not. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a, a real balance between what we do as public officials and, and public policy towards environmental management and what is really going on. So if you look around New Mexico, we're talking about mining and extractive industries. You know, industries in New Mexico do work to protect the environment that they use. There's a the La Plata Reclamation Project up in uh, the Four Corners area, which is basically looks like a golf course, and it used to be a, a big coal mine. I think there are things that we're doing uh, in our daily lives, and those of us who are concerned, uh, it's good economic sense. And I think, you know, certainly the Bush administration was, advo was an advocate for uh, promoting businesses to come up with technologies to allow us to live cleaner lives, to pollute less, uh, and also to make money at the same time. So to the extent that all those things can work together, I think we need to, to have public policy that supports that. As a small business owner, I am overtaxed, literally. Currently, I pay 46% in state and federal taxes. Please tell us what is your plan for taxes in New Mexico? Well, not to raise them, that's for sure. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned that we're, we're looking at 32 or 34 new taxes. And I, I certainly think in these economic times, raising taxes is not the solution for anybody. Uh, and I'm a small business person, too, and I was just uh, hit with a notice from the state that they had decided to look at my 2007 taxes and they thought I should pay some more. Uh, so uh, I know what that's like and it is certainly unpleasant when you have to meet, make a payroll, uh, pay health care and all the other things that are associated with running a small business. Um, you know, the state is looking at these taxes to fill a budget hole and I think there is over a billion dollars in, in, uh, in under, is it unappropriated funds for projects and yet we can't seem to kill those projects. It, it seems common sense rather than raising taxes, you stop spending money that you have allocated even though it hasn't been spent yet. <coughs> um, I think that as a small business person when times are tough and times are tough right now, you have to learn how to do more with less. And I think state government should be no different than that. Um, we talked about reducing the size of state government and before we start talking about raising taxes on businesses, we need to start talking about uh, running a, a state that's far more efficient. One of the other things that the state has a tendency of doing is throwing all kinds of tax incentives at large companies because we have this belief that if we attract a, an Intel or a, well, we, we dream about the next Intel, but we attract a solar manufacturing plant or we attract a 
a, a, a back office or a call center for some organization that we're going to suddenly create wealth in New Mexico. The reality is, is wealth is created by companies, by small businesses. And uh, they're businesses that choose to be here, not come here because they're being paid a whole ton of money to build a new building or being given a large amount of tax credits. I think that we need to have uh, uh, funds within the state that are designed specifically to help small businesses uh, grow and expand rather than putting all of our resources into companies that are largely uh, played out in the press as if they're going to create tons of jobs and that are never realized. Uh, so definitely a, a greater focus on small business and less of a focus on sort of the dream that some major Microsoft is going to come back to New Mexico and we're going to pay for them to come here. I believe that taxes should be, as a policy, low, broad, fair, equitable, easy to administer, and easy to understand. In the amount of time that I have served in our legislature, we have all but obliterated our tax code. And so is there, are there plenty of opportunities to make taxes lower? Absolutely. But what you're missing are the hidden taxes of complying. And one of the really remarkable things about our system of government and taxation, not just in New Mexico, but across the country, we have over a 93% tax compliance rate. That's why our government works, because you pay your taxes. If you are a physician, and because we have created a loophole or a problem in what they now call column M, if you're an independent physician uh, and you are actually dealing with HMOs, it now costs some physicians as much as $6,000 a month to file their column M taxes. That's crazy. That's just downright crazy. That's what we have done. That is not low, broad, fair, equitable, easy to administer, or easy to understand. There is a problem, and you should be able to easily comply. So that's the first thing that we need to look at. Um, the next thing, and, and when we are looking at taxation, when you go online, you should just alone be able to complete your taxes. It should be that simple. Since this administration has been here, we have taken uh, a gross receipts tax system and literally turned it into Swiss cheese. We used to have a very balanced tax system that included income tax, gross receipts tax. Some people call that a sales tax, but it's not. It's a gross receipts tax and the point of nexus is different. Uh, property tax, and in our state the property tax has been remarkably low. I know any of you who have experienced tax lightning are going to argue that, but uh, they are low. And, and corporate taxes. Uh, and the way that we have our tax system set up, we used to have this kind of like four-legged stool, and we would weather almost any storm. The great divider, believe it or not, was when we took the tax off of food. And I will tell you that that sounded mean, but it was the lowest, broadest, fairest tax. When we took the tax off of food, we destabilized the cities, the counties. Can we take it back? No. I think our only direction forward is actually to switch to a sales tax type of taxation, but this particular administration has created a vertical tax system. That is, fewer people are paying more taxes. We are better served when we all have a stake in government at a very low rate. Yeah. Next question is, for Janice, do you think subsidizing rail Good use. <laughs> I didn't tell anyone to write that either. You may not believe me, but I Oh, well, let me say, since I was on the floor the year that this passed, and we said, um, is there a plan? There was no plan. I said, do we have a, a, a cost-benefit analysis? No cost-benefit analysis. But we went forth and we built a rail runner. And from, the, you know, I, from that day until today, we would have been able to provide each one of you sufficient taxi cab rides to and from Santa Fe, and it still would not have cost what it cost us to build a railroad. Wow. What you are not seeing is the cost of the contract. The contract requires about $2 million per
per year, and, and, and don't hold me to this one, but it, it's a safety upgrade that is required by the contract. And there is an additional clause in the contract that says if we've done not enough safety requirements, that BNSF can come back and hold us, hold the legislature responsible for more money, and that's over and above operations. Now, for those of you who live in Bernalillo County, we just assessed ourselves a tax to pay for the rail runner. We are not going to generate enough income to even cover the operations. So before we did that and before we, our economy went in the toilet, here's what it would cost to cover operations for you to get on the rail runner. $14.71 any time you set foot on the rail runner. That cost has now escalated. And if you include the uh, maintenance costs uh, in, in addition to operations, you're looking at about $85 a person. Now, you can argue that we subsidize our roads. Everybody drives on our roads. But you know, it's not quite the same. Everybody who drives pays into the roads in one way or another, be it a gas tax. There are a number of other taxes, and everybody participates. So the question now becomes, can we afford the rail runner? Can we afford the railroad? And I'm looking at the budget. And it's really difficult, but let me tell you how hard it is going to be, because I was just up in Santa Fe and there were good Republicans who reminded me to be a, be a brave Republican and don't forget that we subsidize roads, but we don't have the money. And that's the bottom line, we don't have the money. So as governor, <coughs> I will look at any other way to make this pay, and that's probably a longer haul, but I don't think the numbers are going to be there because they weren't there to begin with. <coughs> So yeah. subsidizing uh, seats on Aero Mexico flights out of uh, <laughs> out of yeah. the Sunport also, so mm -hmm. that's true. Um, and that's going to a private company. Um, I think most public transportation systems in the world are subsidized. Public transportation is not actually designed to uh, be profitable. It's designed, I think, over the long term to reduce the wear and tear on other sorts of transportation infrastructure. Uh, our bus system, if anyone's taken the bus or seen the rapid rides, they're mostly empty most of the time. Yes. And, you know, the only system in the world that I have seen that is really packed all the time is in Japan. Uh, and those trains cost billions and billions to build, and they pay for them over 30 or 40 years. Um, I like the Rail Runner. Uh, it's kind of fun, and my three-year-old son had a great time going up on it. How many of you commute on it? Okay, well, I, don't, I, know one, I know one person, one Republican I know commutes on it. Um, I, I think maybe it has some use uh, for tourism. If they could get it to the airport, maybe that would be a great way to get more people on it. And honestly, you pay 25 or 30 bucks to take the bus from the airport to Santa Fe. I think uh, someone who flies in would probably be happy to subsidize part of that 85 bucks with a $30 ticket up to Santa Fe. Um, you know, I, I, it's a great thing to have, but I certainly don't think it's going to be profitable. Can we get rid of it? No, it's there, and we're going to have to figure out ways to make it at least partially pay for itself. But realistically, I think it's going to be subsidized for as long as, uh, no matter who wins, this this campaign is going to be subsidized. It's it's uh, something that we've an albatross that we've got around our neck and we're stuck with it. Some cost. Some cost. That's right. Some cost. Yep. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's a weird thing. Sure. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. That's right. It's some cost. Sell it. Sell it. Maybe Richard Branson could buy it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was on the Channel 4 morning sh uh, the Sunday morning show. I did bring up the idea, since it runs predominantly through Indian lands, we could allocate casino cars on the train. That might be it's probably, it's probably a good idea. But I'll, uh, I'll digress. We'll go to the next question. <laughs> An organization in Washington, D.C. known as Americans for Tax Reform, Grover Norquist, uh, has a pledge. So we're going to, this is tougher than what you would do to not raise taxes or solve the budget. Would you take a binding pledge with your John Hancock on there not to raise taxes? Not sure. sure. Okay. Janice? No. And the reason I, I do not sign pledges is I am responsible and beholden currently to the people who elect me. 
not the Americans for Tax Reform? It's a really interesting question because if you're not certain, we're lobbied very heavily to do so. Have I raised taxes? I have not. Have I slipped once or twice and raised fees where it was necessary? Yes. And so when you take a pledge like that, um, you know, you, it puts you in a box that prevents you from serving your constituents. And I hope that you will think about that because my only obligation is to you. Janice, how will you make state government more transparent and accountable? I don't know if you wrote this one. Someone, someone who knew you might have written this one. So, transparent and accountable government, what do you know about that? Wow. Um, well, I would say it was fun, and I must tell you, taking the webcam to the legislature was really a remarkable experience. And, uh, and indeed, the speaker was a little mad at me. And it's okay. You know, the, that, that adage that sunlight is the best disinfectant is absolutely true. And so there are things that we do in state government that you're not even aware of. And, and do you need to go and watch all the time? No. But I think what people are saying is you need to have access. If you are interested, you should be able to easily get the information. So we need websites that accurately portray the activities of agencies. They do not. Um, and, and you know, none of that is difficult. I would like for you to be able to go on in real time, be able to see where your budget is going, where we stand. Uh, we have tried several times to pass a bill to that effect. We, have, we don't have it, but I believe that we can do it. You should be able, from where you live, to engage in any public hearing. The technology is there. It's not even expensive. The, what remains is it, it's really nice to open up um, the legislative process, but a lot of policy is made at the agency level. One of the things that has really distressed me about the way that our agencies respond, especially the Department of the Environment. Anybody ever go to an NMED hearing? And <laughs> well, here's how it typically works. The hours are really inconvenient, the room is really small, and oftentimes there's no room for the, for the regular citizens. Please don't think that's an accident, because it's not. It's time to change that. You know, if, if our city council and our board of education can open up their processes, why not state government? But here's the real big albatross in the room. Currently, our legislature is, um, is pretty, pretty well dominated by the Democratic Party. The decisions are made in the caucus, and I respect the caucus atmosphere, but you need to know all of those decisions are made in secret. And so if you happen to watch a webcast of the floor of the House of Representatives, which is just happening every once in a while, and you notice that there are people like me arguing our hearts out to empty chairs, it is because the decision was already made. I hope that bothers you. More cameras, more access, we've got the tools. Don't they also hold <coughs> some of those hearings at very odd hours so no one can show up? Absolutely. Some early Sunday morning, midnight. <laughs> Uh, I agree with Janice completely. I mean, if, if, if you can watch all the terribly boring minutia of what goes on in Congress on C-SPAN 1 and 2 at any hour of the day, you ought to be able to do it here in New Mexico. Um, we have the technology, Janice is correct, uh, and it shouldn't be very complicated. I mean, you've got to ask yourself why we can't do it already. And it's obviously because we have legislators who don't want you to know what's going on up there have people in state government who don't want you to know. Uh, and that should be something that uh, our next Republican governor pushes very hard for very quickly. Uh, because the longer we go without knowing what's going on in Santa Fe, the longer taxpayers suffer. Someone asked an interesting question here that uh, I'm going to ask Doug now. I pre prepare to take a pause and take a few minutes. What plans do you have to protect New Mexicans when the U.S. currency collapses? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got a very happy outlook on uh, 
<laughs> things moving forward. So you are a lifetime member of the NRA, I see. So. <laughs> no, aside from get your gun. My <laughs> gold. Um, what? My gold. Um, I, I was actually just talking about this with my father last night, um, and I think there's a lot of fear. It depends on what you watch and what you read that the U.S. currency is, you know, collapses imminent. I was just at a John Varela event last night, uh, and that's what he was talking about. Um, I lived in Asia, and you know, there's a great deal of fear on what is coming from China and the power of the the power of the yuan. Uh, but I would say this: the, the yuan would not be as powerful if we did not all live at Walmart, if we did not all shop and spend to excessive uh, levels as we do in this country and buy all the things that we buy that we probably don't need that are all made in the countries that we believe are going to take over our currency, we wouldn't be worried about it. But the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, for the Chinese to keep their economy going, they need to sell stuff to us. And so uh, I, I actually don't share that concern that the dollar is going to collapse and so I would uh, suggest to you that you remember when we were all worried that the Japanese were taking over the United States back in the 80s when they bought Rockefeller Center, were buying every golf course in Hawaii, and we were convinced that the Japanese were going to take over the United States. And what happened? The bubble burst in Japan. The yen has been uh, terribly weak except for the last couple months. Uh, for the last 10 years, they've been in an economic slump. Uh, interest rates are zero just to keep money, cur currency flowing in, in Japan, and Japan does not control the so have some faith in the uh, um, industry of this country and the industry of all of you uh, to keep our economy strong because I am fairly confident it will continue to be so uh, in the future. I'm a soccer coach. I believe in ice. If I have ice, I don't need it. And that's how I view the, the current condition of our currency. So here's, here's the way that I view this. We should make sure that we have sustainable agriculture in the state of New Mexico. We have to take care of us first. We should make sure that, I, I don't know who said buy gold, but you know what? We should do that. We should also make sure that we protect our permanent fund. It is probably one of the most remarkable things that has been done in this state and treat it for what it is. It is a remarkable asset. That being said, this state is better poised than any other state to meet this challenge. This state has rare metals that can be mined that are needed by China, by India. We should be exporting the uranium that is in our state is the second to the highest grade in all of the world, and it's sitting in our ground. <coughs> we actually have a buffer if we will look at what we can do. We are not helpless by any stretch of the imagination, but we do need to look at, at participating not just within our own little shell. We actually can go to the aid of these other nations who, quite frankly, hold the paper on our nation. I think in that part we can create a balance. And there is one other thing that I will tell you as I think about the ice side, the, the very conservative side, I truly, truly worry when we sell water rights to foreign countries. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. we should not do that. Sustain us first. Yes. Okay. Janice, explain your position regarding educational funding, charter schools, and other alternative arrangements relating to education. Cool. I'll try not to get too upset here. <laughs> um, let me start with the charters. Well, let me just start at the beginning. Our schools are failing. They are failing so badly that two weeks ago, our children ranked dead last, dead last in math, science, and engineering. We no longer have Mississippi to claim. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to ask yourself, how is it that a small state like this with two national laboratories, Intel and White Sands, and our kids are at the very bottom in the nation in math, science, and engineering? We're withholding knowledge. It is criminal, and I'm tired of it. 
our kids deserve so much better. Now we have thrown a lot of money at education without any results. It is time to step out of that environment. If that means that we go to an education system where the colleges of education don't kick in until you have a content mastery degree in something to be a teacher, then so be it. But make no mistake, there's no silver bullet here. That is one way to approach it. Right now, online classes are available. Our children should have access to them. MIT has had math courses online since 1993, believe it or not, and every class that they have had since 1993 is available today, right now, for free as long as you don't want credit. It's there. I promise you, if we keep withholding knowledge from our children, they are going to go around. That's the good news. Now, as far as our charter schools go, and I'm going to throw in vouchers, is that okay? <laughs> okay. I, I will tell you that a lot of people ask me about vouchers, and I really do believe competition is a good thing, but I have news for you. We don't have enough private schools of any sort, private or parochial, to be competitive. Our charter schools have been set up almost to fail. And I tell you that because when we set up the charter schools, it was really to provide a choice, and some of our charter schools are doing a terrific job. But we have now saddled them with financial arrangements with the state where they have to be in a state-owned building that almost dooms them to failure. The only way you're going to take this back is you have to expect that our children can do it, and you must open every door possible. And that even means bringing in our subject matter experts. I have a whole plan. It's called Project 2012. It's on my website. I hope you'll go read it. There is no silver bullet, but I will tell you what we're doing today cannot stand. <coughs> Education is actually one of my, um, I think, most important issues on this campaign, and I've talked about it really everywhere I've gone around the state. Um, yes, we probably spend more than 40 other states in the United States on public education per student. In some, in some districts, up to $14,000 per student. Uh, yes, we are now at the very bottom in terms of graduation rates. However, there are some amazing schools and school districts in this state. Uh, I was in a school district in Mascara, New Mexico, where they have a 100% graduation rate, <coughs> one and a half administrators, and 60 students, K through 12. Uh, there are districts like that in the state, but they're districts where families are involved, largely with their kids, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and those families uh, promote a very, hard, a very strong work, work ethic with those kids. Um, I sit on the board of the State Charter School Association Coalition Board, and, and you may be interested to know that there are today 4,000 children who are waiting to get into charter schools that don't exist because of the restrictions that Janice just described. And so I'm a, a very strong advocate of loosening those restrictions and allowing choice uh, and more charter schools to grow within the New Mexico. Most people may not be aware, but charter schools are also public schools. And they've only gotten sexy these days, really, in this country, because Obama was talking about them on his campaign. And yet there are restrictions in, 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 in the, the administration's new education policy on charter schools. I'm a firm believer in choice in education, and I think that, that vouchers are an option. I was involved when Gary Johnson was governor in, in getting an organization called uh, Educate New Mexico started in New Mexico. In 10 years, they put 1,500 students, all privately funded, through private schools, whether they be parochial schools, military schools, uh, you know, or, or, other, or other private institutions. Uh, I met a kid a few weeks ago at an event who grew up in the war zone here in Albuquerque. He got a voucher. He ended up at the Manal School, and he just graduated from Princeton. So if we create opportunities for kids, they will succeed. Um, the other thing that I think is a fallacy in the state is that every child in public school wants to go to college. We have a system that sort of gears everyone to go to university, and you know what? They don't. We need to have more vocational training in our public school system. Uh, I think vocational training has fallen by the wayside, and now kids get out of, out of high school with a C minus. They get a lottery scholarship for five years. The first year is just to learn what they should have learned in high school. So there's a problem there. And last but not least, I think that we need to have more state support for parents who choose to homeschool. Yes. This is a rural state, and there are a lot of people. Books. 
And their kids are, are not allowed to, to engage in extracurricular activities such as band and, uh, and athletics at public school. So we need to change that and provide more support for all those. But choice <coughs> is the solution. It's a, it's a long-term challenge, but we can do it, and it has worked. Just to clarify, I think I met the same young man, and it was a privately financed voucher. They're all privately financed. We're, we're, we're That's called right. Educate New Mexico. That's right. Okay, Doug, crime in New Mexico politics is a job. <laughs> Should anything be done about it? Crime or is a what? job, is an occupation? <laughs> Apparently. So that's how we got the unemployment rate down. Well, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I think the last couple of years, New Mexico has been in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times more than I can remember, and all of those articles have been about corruption in the state. So that's a, a fairly sad state of affairs. Um, and I think ultimately what, what you need to do is, is create transparency in government. You know, when we had, uh, when Governor Johnson was in office, I can't remember one instance where there was a grand jury investigation, FBI investigation, uh, even relying on the Attorney General of the State of New York to do our work for us, which is what's happening now, since RAG can't manage to do the investigation. Um, we didn't have any of that. And that's because we had someone in office who was honest, <coughs> hired honest people, and who didn't tolerate uh, any uh, impropriety or even the appearance of impropriety. You know, when I sat on the Judicial Standards Commission, we would go after judges because of the appearance of impropriety, because the appearance leads to mistrust of government and a, and a, and a belief that the government is unreliable. And Janice mentioned being, you know, shaken down by state officials to do business in the state. That's bad. And I think it's very simple that you have a leader who's willing to can anyone Who's in, who, who, where there is even the slightest appearance of impropriety. Um, it doesn't have to be that complicated. We talk about it all the time as this is the leading issue. I think it's a very simple issue. You get an honest person in office and they'll clean house. It's going to be tough to add to what Doug said, but I think I can help just a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, the shakedowns actually do happen, and it has been surprising to me to talk to state employees, and, and I have seen it myself, and I said, why are you doing that? And, and the response very typically was, is, well, how do I make my money if I don't? And there is a real problem there. If we are hiring <coughs> state employees, there needs to be that agreement just like with your employees that your salary is sufficient, so shaking down somebody else is absolutely positively inappropriate. And I'm not sure that that, that is a shared understanding. And so I would go back to ethics training because I think we have to start there. But I, I want to mention something that doesn't come to the fore often enough. We have actually set our state up to do this. They are called quasi-governmental entities. The Regional Housing Authority the Mortgage Finance Authority, the New Mexico Finance Authority, the Spaceport Authority. The reason I'm mentioning, oh, read it, I forgot that. The Renewable Energy Transmission Authority. The reason I mention these entities, and they are really a burr under my saddle, is that they are, by definition, quasi-governmental, so they have all the, the benefits of being a government, but none of the oversight. In many cases, these entities have bonding authority, some of them have taxing authority, and some of them have the right to execute eminent domain. And you have no right of redress. Zero, zip, nada. There are 27 of these entities in this state. I hope that you and I, and I will just end this because Doug said this very well, quasi-governmental entities. They are a nice convenience, but at what price? I'm not sure how you answer this question, but I'm going to ask it to both of you. Okay. This involves some knowledge of your, your colleague, fellow uh, seeker of office. What issues do the two of you disagree on and why? Aside from the pledge issue, which we have a disagreement on, do you know if any 
issues often. They're, they're asking, you can say, I don't know often. Do you know what? <coughs> I, I, actually, it, it is a frightening thing, but I have tremendous respect for, for this young man. <laughs> <laughs> I think her. On, uh, actually, the, the, the pledge part was new, but I, I, you know, in his defense, I will tell you he hasn't been in the arena where where you can see the other side. So I am sure if we dig down, uh, I may not like the way he dances, and we might disagree there. I like to do. You probably wouldn't like it. Okay. <laughs> did you did were you uh, in favor of vouchers? I am in favor okay. of vouchers. Okay. Yeah. Pro probably not much. <laughs> <laughs> Should, this is the last question we're going to ask of this, uh, of the, me reading the answers, and we're going to have our friends in the media ask a few, and then uh, get your own questions prepared in the back of your minds. But we'll finish this portion of the program with a question for Doug. Should we eliminate cap or continue to expand subsidies to the film industry? <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the law that was created to support the film industry was actually uh, created under Gary Johnson um, in, gosh, I'm thinking it was 96, something like that. And, and really Richardson has leveraged that and, and probably enhanced the, the subsidies that go to the film industry. I've been asked this question a number of times, and I think it's great that we have movie stars <coughs> and film production involved in New Mexico. But if I'm not mistaken, and you probably have a better knowledge of this. I'm not sure if it's actually been determined that it's profitable for the state. There are conflicting studies on this. Um, it's great that it has uh, allowed New Mexicans to, at least many New Mexicans, to learn new skills and, and you know, get involved in productions. And in fact, there's, a, there's a, a show that has rented a full floor in my office building for like five years. It's a, I don't know what it's called, but it has to do with Drugs and FBI and investigations. <laughs> this is what New Mexico is about, right? Yeah. Uh, um, but I, I think it remains to be seen whether it's profitable for the, for the citizens of the state. You know, when when uh, when there are no movies being made, all these facilities that we have here are not making any money, and they're not employing people, and people have to go find jobs elsewhere. This is a very very competitive business, and there are countries in Eastern Europe which are offering subsidies that make our subsidies look like a couple of cents and movies are going there uh, so you know I'm, I'm excited that we are on uh, the map as a movie making state but I am doubtful that it is a long term profitable enterprise for New Mexico <coughs> when we passed the 15% credit against expenses. Now, let me back up and tell you that I uh, had part ownership of an audio and video production company in California, and that operated for 20 years. It was very interesting to watch the industry, and what I learned about were the bottom dwellers. These were the guys who wanted all the free stuff and didn't pay their bills. Well, did we invite them to New Mexico? Yes, we did. So, yeah. and, 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 and there are good things. And please know, I like the industry. I love the creative side of it. But I was the only one on the floor when we were passing this 15% credit against expenses that voted no. And boy, did I feel like I was sticking out like a sore thumb. Because, you know, isn't it cool to have all the, the actors here? Well, yeah, it is cool. Well, that 15% credit against expenses is now a 25% credit against expenses. Let me rephrase that to you. How many of you own businesses in here? Just raise your hand. Okay, here's how a credit against an expense works. You turn in your expense and we give you 25% back right now today. That's what we are doing. That is not a rebate. That is not a credit. It is a credit against <coughs> expenses. I actually think it may be unconstitutional. What we have turned, returned so far in this industry is over $86 million. So, is an industry going to stay in a state that is offering 25 cents for every dollar that you spend? And I'm just going to ask you to think about how stable is this industry. That is not the only thing that we have done in this particular industry. We have interest-free loans. So far, and, and, and some of those loans were simply interest-free, and all they have to do is pay them back on time. And there's nothing on the back end. 
That is, we don't get a cut of the profits. We also have loans where we get a cut of the profits <coughs> on the back end. Here are the two problems that we have. This comes from state dollars that are normally invested on your behalf in safe investments, and they yield on a regular basis between 65 and 8%. Well, you're out that money. And so far, the only return we have gotten on any of the movies is right around $345,000. And I'm not done. Because the state also said that uh, if, you, if a film industry wanted to come in and use a location, it was free. <coughs> and we purchased tons of equipment and placed it at all of our universities, and that is free. We have driven media businesses out of businesses business already in this state. My ba and, and the bottom line is, is well, I'm, I'm grateful they are here, but I want businesses that can sustain themselves over time by themselves. Mm -hmm. We have about a half hour left in the program, and we have some folks from the media here, at least one of whom has asked for an opportunity to ask a few questions. So would at least two people I know of are here from the media. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Special privilege time for the media. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the applause. Um, Luis Armiento here, um, editor for El Semanario, Spanish language publication based here in Albuquerque. And um, I know this is a very hot topic. It's in the agenda, maybe not at the top of the agenda, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be an interesting question for my readership. Uh, as far as immigration goes, uh, what would your stance on that be? Would you support a um, immigration reform? Should it pass um, Congress? Or what, what, what's your stance on it, basically? Janice is first. I get to go first. You know, I, I am actually a fan of immigration. You know, it, it strengthens our country. I think where we get into trouble is when we are abusing the rules of any country. And, and that is, is how do you enter the country? And we have people who have stood in line for years and years behaving legally, and, and now they feel that they're at the back of the line. We have a very special issue with our border in Mexico. We have families that are across the border. Surely, surely we can find a way that we can create some type of traffic that will be within the law. And so reform, I hope so. I do hope so, I'm very soon. I actually agree with Janice. Uh, I mean, we do have immigration laws on the books, and those are obviously federal responsibility. Uh, I think we benefit in this country through immigration if it makes sense, and, and uh, we obviously have a policy right now that does not make sense. Uh, you know, it's funny, I was, up in, I was up in Raton, and I was having a candidate forum, well, not a candidate, I was the only candidate. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there was a, a guy up there, he says, we need to do something about immigrants. We need to get rid of all the illegal immigrants in, in New Mexico, except the ones that work for me. <laughs> uh, and I have heard that many, many times. Uh, I think we need a mechanism. You know, we have people who, who are talking about the fact that we provide services to illegal, illegal immigrants. And I think we need a mechanism where these people can be taxed on the money that they make in this country. Uh, instead of sending all of it back to Mexico, and those taxes should be used to at least in part support a lot of the services that they use in this country. But we definitely have an immigration problem and we need a, we need a new policy in this country. Any other questions from the media? Okay. Well, we can open it up. The candidates have consented to allow Unrestrained questions. I'll still be a moderator here. Gentle. Uh, you, sir. Right here. Yeah, um, you know, I'm 100% I'm behind uh, Republican candidates. And I was wondering, if you do be, uh, win the, the uh, governorship, how will you be able to uh, ch implement the things you want to do having to have a, a, a Democratic Congress that's going to fight you and try to keep things the way they are? I believe the legislature, but uh, yeah, Doug. Well, I think it's going to be tough. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know a, a, you, we need a governor who can actually work with both sides. You know, I think that you'll find that if you're talking, Janice probably knows this. There are many, many Democratic legislators right now who are fed up with what.
what's gone on in Santa Fe over the last seven years. Uh, now, they have also largely been complicit in what's been going on in Santa Fe over the last seven years, but I think they've realized that you know, they've been led by the nose and they've had it. They also recognize that the state is in serious financial uh, trouble. And so, I, mean, I had a Democratic legislator who met me uh, you know, uh, in front of my office building a few weeks ago and gave me $500 in cash. And he said, well, would you please not, would you please not tell anybody that I gave this to you? I gave it back to him. But nonetheless, you have people in the legislature who are not Republicans, who recognize that we need good, sound policy. They've had it with this administration. And I tend to believe that we may find more support uh, than uh, we have had in the past and than what we expect. I would also suggest to you that we have an opportunity in this election cycle in 2010 to take back more seats than we have uh, uh, previously. We lost everything in the last cycle, I mean, all of our races we lost. But there is enormous dissatisfaction around the state uh, our polling indicates that 32% that, uh, of Democrats in New Mexico are not planning on voting for a Democrat. And that's legislature and governor. And those are important numbers when you consider you know, uh, that we are 51% Democrat registration in New Mexico. So I believe that you need a governor who can get along, but I also <coughs> believe that we will have more support than we may think we have had in the past. Uh, she gets the answer. Thank you. you know, um, I'm there. I, I serve in the legislature. Please know that in the house that I serve in, there are 25 Republicans and 45 Democrats. You don't get things done unless you can work together. And it is not uncommon for individuals like me to go to my colleagues and say, you know, we know that this is time. Will you please carry my bill, the one that I baby? And you do that because it's right for the state. The colleagues that I serve with, I will tell you, are really quite remarkable. And there's only a handful that I, I really have any question with. And so it comes down to leadership. It is the governor's responsibility <coughs> to set an agenda but more importantly, to set a vision. The one thing that I have going for me is competence, and I really, really dig into the details. My colleagues in the legislature trust that, that I will look, that I will be thoughtful. And I am open to hearing whether or not I have a harebrained idea, and if it's harebrained, why is it? And how do we make it better? These are real human beings. And so one of the things that I've witnessed over the last seven years is legislation that my colleagues were asked to carry that were half-baked. The DWI laws that have gone through in the last seven years, did you, have you counted them? Every year we have updated the DWI laws. It makes it almost impossible for our law enforcement to enforce laws that change that rapidly. The reason that they did that is the executive wanted yet, in my opinion, another headline. And because they were Democrats, they were not allowed to say no, even though they knew the legislation was flawed. I, I simply approach it differently, and I approach the legislature with tremendous respect. I know what it takes, but I also know that as governor, I get to set the vision, and the response to that is, that balance of tension that is necessary to actually preserve a democratic republic, which is what we are. I may, uh, <clears throat> I may be the only country boy here, uh, albeit an Albuquerque resident now. First question, you know where Des Moines is? Mm -hmm. Good, good for you. Um, <laughs> and that's not, not Iowa either. Iowa. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, my question is, do you have any plans uh, to enhance economic development in rural New Mexico? Do I get that question first? That's yes, great. A actually, a, a couple things. Let me go back to sustainability. <coughs> I think our rural communities are vital. <coughs> and, and so when I talk about connectivity, 
that's one of the things that I mean. Every single community in the state of New Mexico needs to be connected. They should not have to drive an hour or two hours for information. It should be available over the internet. What's really interesting is we have more fiber in the ground than any other state in the union. It's not connected. So one of the things, when I look at rural communities, the first thing I look at is their library because it becomes the focus for making sure that we build a business case to, to give that connectivity. There are other issues, and again, let me remind you, we have entire communities that do not have power and they do not have running water. We had capital outlay that was squandered. It was supposed to have built out that degree of infrastructure. So I don't think there's anybody in this room who thinks that we should have a community that is still hauling water that might be tainted in any way. We, but we didn't do it. Now, there is another role for our rural communities, and that is the sustainability of our state, and I hope you'll think about it. When we start driving communities, rural communities, out of where they live into the cities, we start losing our food production. We start losing some of the very things that are important, but we also increase the opportunity to share things like H1N1. I hope that when you look at our state, that you will revere the folks who are willing to live in rural communities because they are providing your food, and it's really important. Thank you. Amen. Um, I agree with Janice in terms of you know technology delivery to rural communities. I mean, you know, there are some amazing towns in this state, and very few people live there. Um, but the traditional industries in those communities, in, in many respects, is agriculture, ranching, uh, dairy, and those businesses in our state are being squeezed also. Uh, so in line with what Janice says, we need to be working towards protecting those businesses. I mean, the dairy industry in New Mexico, it used to be number three, number four in the country, I think. I think we're now down to number nine. Uh, the dairy just uh, closed. Uh, you know, those are businesses that uh, need more cooperation with the state. I think you know, what we've done in New Mexico, uh, in certainly industries such as agriculture and dairy, which, in which have the environment department is involved, them, is we have created a very adversary relationship between the state and those businesses that work in those communities to make it very difficult for those communities to do business. I uh, was talking with our former Lieutenant Governor Walter Bradley, who represents Dairy Farmers of America, and he you know, wants to help candidates and wants to get involved in this campaign, and he's afraid to. He's afraid to because he's afraid of having new policies and new regulations uh, shoved down his industry's uh, throat by this current administration as a threat. Uh, so we need a more uh, engaged state government, a government that's involved and willing to work with local communities to come up with you know, creative solutions that don't just mean putting a call center in the middle of nowhere. Because those are unsustainable kinds of businesses. They use up tax credits and then people leave and they don't pay very much. Um, you know, there are, are lots of businesses, fish farming, aquaculture, all kinds of things that we can be looking at around the state to provide jobs uh, in rural communities <coughs> that we need, to, we need to put our energy into. Okay, uh, you guys have been, first of all, I want to say thank you. You guys have been great. You're articulate and you're very clear. Uh, but I want you to speak some more on these uh, three issues, if you can. First of all, I am a passionate Milton Friedman capitalist. And I uh, am wildly opposed to income tax either on businesses or people. And I want to hear what you're going to do to change our tax structure, either a VAT, a sales, a flat, or a fee-based system. This is so important. We're so stupid with the way we destroy our businesses, we destroy ourselves with the way we tax and regulate and all that other stuff. I am a passionate nuclear energy advocate. Just, uh, I want to hear what you're going to do to help mining and oil and nuclear and all this other stuff. And the food and the farmers and the ranchers. And the last thing was, oh, the corruption in New Mexico. Do you realize that the, uh, the retiring special agent in charge of the Albuquerque 
the FBI office said last year, I forget his name, that New Mexico is the wor most corrupt state in the union. And when you compare us to California and Illinois, that says a lot. If we could find an honest judge in New Mexico, I'd like for you to point him out. Okay. What do you <laughs> So I, I think we've talked about corruption. Um, double dip it. We'll double dip corruption. Um, you know, you, you need you need an honest leader who's willing to clean house in Santa Fe, and you know that's at all levels of government uh, where a chief executive has the ability to uh, to take action. Interestingly, if are any of you familiar with a think uh, uh, an organization called Think New Mexico? They're a think tank in Santa Fe, and they have a a, a new uh, report out on corruption. Uh, I think that we need greater regulation on lobbying and lobbying expenditures in Santa Fe. Uh, you, know, how, you, you don't know how much money a lobbyist is spending on golf games or beer or scotch or steaks for the state legislators. I think they ought to report it. I think that's one area of transparency we have not discussed, but that's certainly something I'm an advocate for. Uh, nuclear, I've already mentioned that I'm a big fan of, of nuclear uh, energy. We have mining in the state. We have enrichment, soon to be enrichment. Uh, we have uh, a, an amazing success in WIP for long-term disposal, and I think that we need to leverage that, considering that nothing's ever going to happen in, in Nevada as long as Harry Reid has anything to do with it. Uh, but we have it here. It's been it's worked. Sorry? It won't be long. Uh, and I, quite honestly, think we ought to have considered power generation here as well. Uh, we, we, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to do it, and the only piece that's missing is uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, turning yellow cake into I mean turning the ore into yellow cake, which is done I think in Metropolis, uh, Illinois. We ought to be able to have all of it here. Yes. Uh, and from a tax perspective, you know I'm open to anything. I, I worked for Steve Forbes when he ran for president, uh, and Steve was a huge advocate of a flat tax, and something uh, of that nature would certainly be interesting for me. It would make things a lot easier. Uh, and uh, and should be something that we ought to consider. Um, let, me, let me start with the taxes. You know, we've made Swiss cheese out of our current tax policy. It actually was quite an eloquent tax policy, um, and, and there's almost nothing left of it. Um, and, and so the flat tax is something to think about. My guess is, is uh, before we ever get a flat tax, you will see a shift to a sales tax. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and is that simpler and easier? No, it isn't. A flat tax is by far the easiest type of tax to administer, uh, but there's less control over it. Um, one of the problems we have in our state is we have small communities that if we didn't move the taxes through the state government, the communities themselves would actually starve to death. And so it, it isn't quite as easy as, as saying we'll just do a flat tax no matter where we are because it really doesn't work that way. And, and I will tell you again that I support those small communities, but there's some real harsh realities. It's just like Mosquero, I think, actually, they only have, it's an, one entire school district, and there are only 39 kids in it right now. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's some real issues there. Um, corruption, I, I have to just give credit where credit is due. If you've seen the Think New Mexico proposal on prohibiting lobbyists or businesses from uh, giving campaign contributions if they are going to have a contract with the state, uh, and it's a great proposal, but I do want you to know that Representative Tom Taylor from Farmington actually introduced that bill last year. I supported it then, I support it now, and I just want you to know where it came from. <coughs> but I want to talk about nuclear, um, because what we're not talking about is something that is on the horizon. The Japanese already have it. It is called, uh, the, new, the new term is a small modular uh, nuclear facility. No, also. That, yes. Yeah, also known as a right-sized reactor. These are hardened facilities. They take no water. You put them in the ground. They will produce easily 25 megawatts of power. They will last for 20 years. Then you change them out. It is time to start doing that. And the real advantage to a right-sized reactor is our ability to decentralize our grid. Anytime you have large energy production facilities, um, I'm just thinking defensively here, that becomes a hard target. <clears throat> the more decentralized you are, the less chance of failure. Single points of failure are stupid. But we also should be doing more reprocessing. We are doing enrichment in the southern part of the state at the Natural Enrichment Facility, but the real value of nuclear 
is reprocessing, and don't anybody say spent in here. It is used fuel. We need to reuse it. The technology is there. Yes. We have to have the will to do it. But we, in this state, more than anybody else, have the ability to do that. And while I'm on nuclear, we should be producing medical isotopes in this state. We should have three facilities up today, right now, because we're losing 35% of our capacity for medical isotopes <coughs> this year, and that's Canada. We only produce 5% of the medical isotopes used in this country. Now who's dependent? It ain't oil. It's medicine. It's us. Stay <laughs> <Hey>, New Mexico. <laughs> I'm all for food. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a National Geographic not too long ago, and they were showing the best places in the world to grow food. And we have a little bit going on here. But if, if you can buy gold, but you can't eat it. So I'm all for that. Um, had some farmers in my relative, in my family too. But anyway, um, New Mexico is a sovereign state, and how much can we be sovereign right now? And how much is the EPA and all the federal crap going to affect us in our uh, policies? I can start with that. Um, one, I think there's going to be a new day for governors, and so let me start with I believe in the Constitution, and the Constitution says that. Those powers, not specifically reserved to the federal government, belong to the state. Yeah. That means the governor must say no. Right. You have to yeah. stand up and say no. <laughs> there are government programs that come to us at such great cost. And let me give you the, my favorite example, Medicare and Medicaid. And the argument that I hear time and time again Oh, we have to spend some more because for every dollar we spend, we get three dollars. And who tells us how to deliver our services? Is it meeting the needs of our citizens? Now, I will tell you, it's a tough argument to say we should do away with that three dollars. I, I, I will give you that. But you need to think about it. So let's look at education. Look at what has happened to our system of educating our children when we started taking sub subsidies from the federal government. There are times you have got to weigh what we are doing before we do that. And you know what? If you're not sure, uh, if you think we're broke, you ain't seen nothing until you look at the federal budget. It is time to write our federal budget. We're in a deficit position that makes us vulnerable no matter what we do. Have you all been following the Real ID scandal? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, is everyone familiar with it? No. Um, well, the, 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 the federal government has said to all the states, you have to produce a, a, a certain type of ID identification that you, know, you can use when you go to the airports and so forth. Sorry? Yeah. And uh, what New Mexico has been doing is actually giving you know, New Mexico a driver's license to illegal immigrants. So we are stuck in a little bit of a bind here in New Mexico in that uh, we are not in compliance with federal law, uh, aside from the fact that I don't actually believe in this federal law, that we have to have a special ID. Uh, but now where we are is that since we're not in compliance and we don't have a waiver, uh, if you are a U.S. citizen and want to travel on a plane to another state right now, you actually have to have a passport because they will not accept the New Mexico driver's license, which, by the way, we've spent millions of dollars redesigning in Santa Fe. Uh, so it has chips and other sorts of information in it. So right now you have to spend a couple hundred bucks and FedEx fees and so forth if you're planning on traveling somewhere uh, for the holidays. I think obviously you know this is this is an important issue, but more important is encroachment of the federal government to having more and more information on our our, our individuals, I mean, individuals in this country. You know, it used to be if you had if you <coughs> wanted health insurance, that you could just they would give you assign you a number. But after HIPAA legislation was passed, you have to provide your social security number. Now, I'm not the kind of person who likes to give out his social, his social security number, but now I can't get health care through my company without providing it. I think what the federal government is doing is slowly encroaching on our uh, individual rights and freedoms. And I think it uses laws such as Real ID to have states then do it for them. Um, and, and, and Janice is right, what we need is governors who are willing to say no and not put up with it. Now, you mentioned the EPA. I think to some extent, having you know, uh, uniform laws, environmental protection laws, makes sense. 
Uh, and yet we have a situation in New Mexico where we have counties, such as Santa Fe County, going and creating its own set of rules on how to access mineral rights, for example, in the Galisteo Basin, preventing companies from, from in, engaging in oil and gas exploration. Uh, I think we have to have a government, and Bill Richardson let them do it, and the That's Environment right. Department let them do it. So we need a government that is prepared to stand up for uniformity, because without uniformity, businesses can't do business. You don't have consistent rules in markets. And we do not want to be a state that has some set of crazy rules that no one wants to comply with, that no one can comply with. So we need a governor who's willing to stand up uh, and, and make sure that we have that environment, and who's willing to say no to the federal government when it tries to force us uh, to let go of individual freedoms little piece by little piece. Hopefully a short one, uh, but I'm point of information relating to the Real ID Act uh, and Doug. I understand that 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 they passed the law back in like 04 or 05 in Congress. They've had extension after extension after extension. This was a massive unfunded liability on the states. Right. Now, I think that whole passport deal doesn't start till January one. If Napolitano Homeland Security doesn't, just to make sure that no one runs out and. Stands in line at the post office tomorrow in the middle of Christmas shipping season so you get a passport. Uh, everyone gets upset behind you because I've been there in the post office when someone's doing a passport and it's a real pain. So we got one more question. And the gentleman in the back there was helping with the film. You both say one more transparency. I'm curious how much more transparency you want. Describe the limit on transparency. It's a good question. That's a great um, I don't know what the limit is. I, I think uh, you know when government engages in making policy and, and enforcing policy, uh, there ought to be transparency. I think when government engages in legal action against citizens, there ought to be transparency and appropriate due process. Um, I think when taxpayers' dollars are spent hiring political appointees, there ought to be transparency. An interesting story. Uh, Richardson had a press release last week that he had uh, terminated you know, a group of uh, political appointees. Well, what was not reported was at the same time he hired another group. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who works at the State Fair and they said, you know, it's interesting. Uh, they just canned about four people, but they brought in a new person at a salary of $89,000 at the same time. So, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, in, in, any, in any opportunity uh, that government has to make sure that taxpayers and citizens who are represented by government has to make its actions transparent, it should take those actions. Um, you know, uh, uh, certainly meetings, that, you know, policy meetings and strategy meetings and so forth on how you want to get things done, it's probably a little bit excessive, but, you know, anything that has direct impact on people, that people need, people deserve to, uh, to have access to that information. I think that, that really is an, an excellent question. And so, as a policymaker, there are places that you do need limits. And, and having been there with someone who wanted to bring a camera into the restroom, ah. I placed my limits. <laughs> okay, well that's obvious. <laughs> <awesome. laughs> <laughs> you know, that, uh, th there has to be individual privacy. Now that being said, if there are policymakers together, um, whether you are at, at the infamous bull ring or not, you know, that still has, that, that's open. And if we're discussing it and you happen to be sitting there, huh, you know, that should be on the record, always on the record. There, there are lots of places that, that we could do a lot better and things that you really don't see that I wish you could see. Um, one of the things that happens right now, and, and, and the, the moving of money in the state government kind of to, to, um, to hold off Peter and pay Paul over here, we do that all the time. Personally, I think that is a really lousy method. And, and the way that, that we start seeing it is all of a sudden payments aren't being made to providers in the, the farther reaches of the state. Uh, we had once. Uh, set of, of DWI uh, rehabilitation providers who had not been paid for 11 months. Now, 
if we had the degree of transparency where you could see the anticipated payments against revenue, then I think we could have said, oh, dear agency, what are you doing over there? And where is the money going? Um, the amount of money that is dumped into our universities that are completely unaccounted for is terribly troubling to me. And so I think you need, you know, I, so I, I'm trying to find the limit of transparency, and I guess I'm going to say it's at the bathroom. <laughs> is a 501c3. We did charge you five bucks to get in the door, but really barely covers the room and a few other things. We want to continue doing these and other events, and we appreciate your coming to this event and supporting exchange of information. Uh, so I hope you include us in your end of year plans there. Uh, there's food available. There's information available on the candidates that either were here or sent a representative. And on that note, I would be interested, or the foundation would be interested, not only in getting your reaction to this event, but in your encouraging the other candidates who have declared to attend events like this. We plan this, as both of these two folks know, with plenty of time for planning. So encourage them, uh, if you're still undecided, or if you just want to have a better exchange of information with more people here. And, uh, Thank you for coming again, taking time out of your lives, and thank you to the candidates. So let's give them a hand.